All right. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, let's see. Sorry for the shortened notice. Um, I guess we sent out a message last week. Um, so the goal is to do um, a bit of a high-level walkthrough, just introduce people to how the source code is organized, how to find things. Um, there was an earlier talk, I guess it was um, about a year ago, maybe, um, that was targeting just new contributors, how you check out the code, how you clone it, how you run do see make, how you build, how you open a bug, how you commit something and sign it off and open a pull request and all that stuff. Um, so for that, I would refer back to that other um, talk that's recorded, it's on YouTube. This is gonna skip all that and sort of jump straight into the code. Um, what files are in Git, how they're organized, all that stuff. Um, remember to use the right keyboard here. Okay, um, so let's start by just looking at what is in ceph.git. Um, so if you check out ceph, um, the top level has a bunch of files. There's um, a few interesting things like, um, you know, the source code licenses, copying files, whatever. Um, there's a coding style file that might be worth looking at um, that just outlines what our um, coding style for C++ is. Um, it's basically based on the Google style guide for simplicity with a few variations that are sort of noted in that file. Um, nothing too exciting, but that's where you find it. Um, there's also, the other big one here is submitting patches, which is sort of a um, procedural thing, how to sign off your commits, what the DCO, the signed off byline actually means, all that stuff. Um, all that stuff's there. The main things though at this top level directory are um, the doc directory, which is all the documentation um, in restructured text that generates docs.ceph.com. So that's one big tree. And then the other big tree is source. Um, and that's where most of it is. All the other ones have like little scripts, um, uh, packaging information. Oh, I guess the third one is QA. So all our QA files are in slash QA. Um, there are um, scripts that you run that generate workloads. There are YAML files that generate technology tasks. Whole bunch of stuff in there. And that's probably its own a whole other thing that just covers that. But we're going to focus on the source directory because that's where all the source code lives. Um, so um, at this level, um, there are a few things. Uh, you see the .cc files for a bunch of the main daemons. So um, Ceph underscore OSD, Ceph underscore MDS, Ceph underscore Mon. These are the main Ceph daemons, and the um, you know the main um, source files for those are there. You put enough number, the right number of C's on there. Um, and there's a you know there's a main function in there that parses arguments and does all that stuff. Um, uh, I guess that's probably as, as good a place as any to start. Um, the well, let's see. That's a little bit more just housekeeping how things are organized. Um, there's an include directory here somewhere. Sorted really confusingly. There's an include directory and there's also a common directory. These are sort of interchangeable. They have all the common code. Sometimes there's a header and include and the .cc file in common. Sometimes both the header and the .cc file are in common. It just sort of grew that way over, over the years, but they're more or less the same, just random infrastructure common stuff. Um, there's a subdirectory for each of the daemon types. So all the OSD code mostly is in OSD. There's one for, um, for the mon, for the MDS, and so on. Um, you can find those there. Um, there's a directory for librbd. There's there's a whole directory for rgw, um, all of that. Um, beyond that, there are a couple other sort of important shared directories. Um, the first one that's probably worth noting is um, the message directory, and there are really two two of these. There's message. Um, which has, so the messenger is a sort of one of the key components in Ceph that handles all the passing of messages between daemons. So it basically hides the network um, from everybody. And so you have um, sort of a abstracted entity, which is a, usually a daemon or a client or some participant in the distributed system 
um, and they instantiate a messenger and then they can send messages to each other. And those, that message passing is asynchronous, sort of like RPC, but you just send a message one way and then maybe you get a reply back. You can define the protocol however you want. That is defined in terms of messages instead of RPC calls. Um, so the message directory has the, um, the classes that define that interface. Um, the main one is messenger, um, which is sort of your, your endpoint. Um, and you, know, you can create one of a particular type. You can, there are calls in here that send a message to a particular destination um, and so on. Um, there's another class called dispatcher, which is basically um, an interface at the receiving end of a message. So each entity that actually is receiving messages um, uh, is a child of the dispatcher class. And it basically just, um, the main thing that happens here is there is a, um, a dispatch, virtual dispatch method that you have to implement that basically gets called for every message that is incoming off the wire. That's very high level introduction there. Um, there are two, two main implementations of this. There's a simple messenger, which is the older one, um, which is under the simple directory. Um, probably don't look at that. There's a newer implementation of this. That's now the default as of starting in Luminous it's called the async messenger. That's sort of a more constrained thread pool. It's better design. Um, that's what everything uses now. The implementation sits in there. Um, but along with the messenger, sort of this abstracted thing that lets you pass messages around are all the messages that actually get sent over the wire. Those are all defined in the messages directory. And you'll see that there are a bazillion of them. Um, some of them are more complicated than others. Let's look at like the simplest one is probably the like a ping message. So each message does something really simple. It overloads the message class. Um, uh, it um, you pass in a, what is that going here? I'm gonna meet you, sorry, you mean. Um, you pass in a type to the message constructor. So each of these messages has a unique integer type um, that distinguishes among between all the other messages, message types. Um, then you, you define methods that encode and decode the payload. Ping doesn't actually have a payload, so it's pretty simple. And maybe a slightly more complicated one is um, the command message, which is used to send a command to the monitor or to a daemon via like Ceftel or via the CLI. Um, so there are a couple of class, couple members to that message that gets sent over the wire. And there's a structure that you use when you're actually using this. This determines which cluster you're talking to, and this is the actual command. Um, and these are helper methods that are just used for debug output so that um, it'll actually show sort of what the contents of the message are when you're looking at the debug logs. Um, but the important ones are encode payload, which basically takes whatever's in the message and generates a byte buffer, basically, that gets sent over the wire, and decode, which unpacks it back into the class. So those are the simple versions. There are some really complicated ones. So if you look at like MOSD op, which is probably one of the most complicated, this is an OSD Rados operation. You'll notice that it's got like, you know, it's got a ton of random stuff. Um, and it's, you know, it's even more complicated because we've changed the format of the message over years, over the years. And so um, a lot of the encoding is feature dependent. So if the client at the other end has different feature bits, then you encode a different version of the message based on what they support. And you have all the compatibility to code to decode older messages or encode old messages for old peers and so on. Um, but by sort of encapsulating it, all that code and all in these individual messages, then the, the rest of the, the consumers of this interface are, are simpler because they just instantiate a message, populate the fields that they care about and say send, and then sort of magically gets sent off over the wire to the other end. Um, okay, so that's, that's um, messenger and messages. Um, let's look at a daemon and walk through its main and see if we can sort of make some progress here. Um, so this is the OSD code. Um, when in main, we parse the arguments um, and then we call this function called global init. Um, this is sort of the, some of the, the, the crafty infrastructure that all the Ceph demons share. Um, there's two, there's sort of two pieces of this. Um, the first piece is in common, there's something called a Ceph context. Um, this is, um, instances of this are usually um, pointers and we usually call them CCT um, for 
I don't know why some random developer decided that's what we were called the variable name all the time. Um, but that's basically um, a class that points to information that is um, shared by one instance of one of your, whether it's a daemon or a client or some entity in memory. Um, and the reason why it's sort of encapsulated in a class is because um, in the future we might have multiple daemons in the same um, process sharing space and so they each have their own subcontext. Um, and in when we actually introduced this, it was because we had, we were creating Liberatus, um, and the way when you're using the shared Liberatus library, you might instantiate multiple clients. And so each of those client instances is associated with one of those subcontexts. Um, but the main thing that the subcontext contains is a copy of the configuration. Um, so all the configuration settings um, are there in memory and they're sort of associated with your subcontext. Um, and so whenever you're doing something in the code that's sort of configuration dependent, you have to pass in a reference to that subcontext so it can figure out what configuration options to apply to that code generally. There are other things like the logging infrastructure. Um, so this log class is a thing that generates bar log Ceph something.log files um, that you can generate entries and they all get sent there and written and so on. So that's associated with that. There are a bunch of class, um, some background threads that like do flush the logs. Um, things like that are all associated with this Ceph context. So this like service thread is and reopen logs, these types of helpers. Um, and there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of random weird stuff in here that dealing with like demonization and so on. Um, but at a high level, subcontext is sort of associated with one of those process. So if you look back here over at, um, the main for the OSD. One of the first things we do is we call this global init function, which is a helper for like, you know, starting up this sort of daemon environment and it returns the subcontext, which is sort of a handle for that newly instantiated thingamajig. Um, notably, one of the important things that's attached is the MD config T. So this is, these are all the config options. So that's stored in config.h. Um, and this is like a generic class that's a big bucket for all the config options. It has methods like get value and set value for getting and setting configuration options. Um, this is some of the oldest code in the tree, and so there's there are sort of some crufty bits around the interface. Um, but at a high level, sort of the interesting part here is that here we have a map of options to values options that get applied to runtime stuff. Um, okay, so that's all in, you'll notice that this, this, lives, this lives in common. So generally speaking, everything in common is stuff that's shared between everything um, in Ceph. So that includes daemons, it includes libratos, libcephfs, librbd. Um, so both client-side libraries that might be shared objects and also randline utilities and, and full, full on daemons. Um, there's another directory that's sort of a parallel that's called global. And this is stuff that is only applies to the daemons. Um, or the command line utilities, because one of the cardinal rules of writing shared libraries is that you shouldn't have any sort of hidden shared state um, that gets, because it, whatever, it pollutes the interface, it just breaks the way that you interact with libraries. If you have multiple parts of your code interacting with the shared library that's linked and they're sharing global variables, it gets totally broken. Um, so there are things in here like um, signal handlers, um, you know, like the thing that handles segfault and generates a nice stack trace in your log files all on here um, and the main thing here is global init is um, a set of helpers for like starting up processes so that's what's getting called over here and it does things like global init um, you know it, it creates a set context here somewhere um, it does things like install signal handlers um, it drops privileges so most of the demons run as user and so it does it at a particular time and in a particular way it does a safe way of um, switching to a non-root user and my laptop just lost internet connection one second um, any questions so far while I fix my laptop Hello. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we have a question about the uh, the attributes. So. Uh, so can you please uh, tell us where does 
the because it depends on the on the object store uh, how many attributes are trying to access but where does all the attributes get set and where do you uh, fetch all the attributes and when are they required can you please run us through uh, how does yeah. attribute, the object gets created gets yeah. set and where it happens sure so that's i mean that's that's a pretty specific question but i i'll i'll work my way there and it's going to lead us through a bunch of stuff um because okay, i'm getting i'm getting about, uh, yeah, sure. can you hear me yeah so mm -hmm. yeah, the thing ahead. is that you said there is uh, two important parts one is the safe context and what is the second is it the logging you mentioned the logs um inside the sub context the two main things that um it does are it's, it's a sort of a vehicle that holds your configuration settings mm -hmm. yes and one mm -hmm. of the other things it also does your logging okay so the, and what the is the second is... okay mm -hmm. sorry 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 about that mm -hmm. So I, I can actually hearing you a little late, so I didn't understand that you were, yeah, so there is a miscommunication going on. So for okay. the daemon, there is one part, which is a safe context, and what is the next part? Is it the messages? Um, so far, those are the two main two things I've talked about, yeah. Okay, so okay. So I talked a little bit about the, um, at a high level, there's the, the messengers. Um, so in, in Seth, mm -hmm. there are different entities. There's There's clients and daemons and whatever. Each of those is sort of a, an endpoint or an entity within the distributed system. And each of those has a messenger that it uses to send messages to other points in the system. Yes. And they also all have a Ceph context because they have their own local configuration settings and so on. Yes. So whenever this, uh, so depending upon which side you're referring to, the context will pull up all the configuration from that part, like defining the yeah. .conf file, right? Okay. Okay. Right. That's exactly. It. Yep. Thank yep. you. Um, okay, so um, let's work our way through the OSD to where we actually store objects. <laughs> so um, let's see, how should we do this? So the Ceph um, OSD.cc, it does some initial startup, it does some de demonization settings, a bunch of really boring stuff just to like start up a daemon. Um, somewhere in here, it will create what's called an object store. This is a really important class that encapsulates the interface for dealing with storage that's stored on the local, on the local, for the local OSD, on the local host. Um, so you think of it kind of like a file system interface, except it's not storing files, it's storing objects. So that is stored um, in the OS directory. OS is short for object store, confusingly. And if you look in there, um, there's an object store.h, which defines this whole interface, which is basically how OSDs in the system talk to their locally stored storage. Um, and you'll see that you, you, know, you can instantiate one. There are a couple different types. So this interface is implemented as file store, sort of the old way of storing objects and files. There's a blue store backend, which is a new way of using block devices. There's a mem store, which is one that's all in memory. It's used mostly for benchmarking. And there's one called k-store that's sort of like a, I don't know, it's a, it stores everything in key value pairs. It's sort of a toy. Um, and um, yeah, so this defines the whole interface. You can, you know, you have objects, you have collections, which are sort of like directories of objects. You have all the operations, you have transactions that mutate those objects and so on. Um, but the, the object store class basically is, um, you know, loading up uh, the class that allows you to access that data. So when the OSC start out, starts up, it does that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So. Is it is it available that the the one with the key value uh, as a toy you said is it there in the git already as a yes. backend? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you look under okay. OS, there are subdirectories. There's there's blue store, there's file store, there's case store, which is the toy, and mem oh, store, okay. which is more a more useful toy that's used for benchmarking. Okay. So if you if okay. you want to look Thank at you. a simplified implementation of the interface, mem store is usually the place to start because it's it's basically just putting everything in memory. Um, you know, mm -hmm. an object has attributes. <laughs> it has an OMAP header, okay. it has OMAP data, it has somewhere in here there's the actual byte data. I think it's abstracted into the subclass, I can't remember, and so on. Okay. So this sort of is the easiest way to understand that interface. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so the OSD is sort of the, the daemon. Um, and so that will instantiate the object store, and then somewhere down here it'll actually um, create um, create an instance. Oh, here it creates all the messengers that it uses to talk over the network. 
Um, so one has one for the client network that faces clients, one for talking to other OSDs. Um, so those all get created and um, we bind them to addresses. We set policies for how reconnects and failures are dealt with. Um, and then eventually down here somewhere, um, we actually instantiate the OSD class. Um, and we call it a knit method, which basically sort of boots it up um, and we demonize if appropriate. <clears throat> and then when, once that actually happens, um, there are various threads started, one of which is processing incoming messages and, and so on. <clears throat> and then we just basically, this, this function just blocks at the wait function. And these are, these are the messenger classes and they're basically just waiting for the messenger to get shut down. And that means it's dispatch loop shuts down. It's, it stops listening for messages. It cleans up and then all these things unblock and then we shut down. So that's the basic flow um, of the main thread. But most of the action happens in, um, in the OSD. So in OSD.cc, the implementation of that class, you'll notice there is in here, there's a dispatch function. Um, that just gets called when a message comes in over the wire. And it basically takes a lock and it makes sure we're not shutting down. It does calls another draft version of dispatch, which um, this is a common pattern that you'll see in all the sort of the Seth pieces. It looks at the message. It says, what's the type? There's a big switch statement that handles the various types and it casts it into the right subclass. Um, so for example, if we get a new OSD map, then we'll look at the handle OSD map. Um, and then we do all the processing associated with that. So in the OSD case, it like takes all the maps that are in the message and it writes them all to disk and it commits them and then it does a bunch of stuff. So that's that. Um, the interesting, the most interesting stuff here that happens in the OSD is um, in this other variant of the dispatch called fast dispatch. It's like dispatch, but it's called um, uh, direct sort of synchronously from the messenger. Um, so they're, uh, you have to be careful about what locks you take. Um, the regular dispatch is is in a worker thread, and so you can block and do all kinds of random stuff. But in fast dispatch, you'd be very careful about what you do. Much faster. Anyway, um, in here, there's uh, if we get a if we get a request, we sort of instantiate a, a wrapper class around it that we can track its progress, um, and then we um, enqueue it onto a work queue. Um, and the OST has this multi-threaded sharded work queue where it's processing operations. Um, there's sort of a opposite function, DQ op, that gets called to pull something off the queue and process it. Um, and basically what that does is it, those ops get eventually mapped to a placement group. There are lots of different placement groups on the OST. Um, and those get called, passed into the PG do request operation. So in the OSD directory, um, we have a bunch of classes. Um, PG is sort of the main one. Um, so in, in Ceph, um, the idea is you have different you have different pool types. Um, in Rados, at this layer, you have different pool types. Um, you have replicated ones and you have erasure coded ones. Um, and in theory, you could add new ones. Um, the idea was always that we would add multiple pool types and they would all implement this abstract PG interface. Um, the way things grew up because there was only one implementation for so such a long time, that interface has gotten really fat, and so it doesn't really quite work that way. And in fact, the replicated pools and erasure coded pools work so similar, they're both log-based, that they're actually both um, sort of specializations of something called um, the primary log PG. So the PG is the generic interface, the only one, um, that, that's the interface that the OSD uses to talk to these. Like this. Don't stop ringing and go away. Sorry. Um, and um, primary log PG is the actual implementation of that, which is the only implementation of it. Um, and it's structured so that all the common code around PG logs and peering and stuff is in PG and primary log PG. And then it has two different backends, one which does replication and one which does um, erasure coding. So there's PG. There's a PG backend, which is sort of this backend interface for these. That's the abstract interface. And there's replicated backend, which is for replicated pools. And there's EC backend, which is for erasure coded pools. So it's sort of this annoyingly complicated class hierarchy where there's, <laughs> there's sort of, there was originally supposed to be um, an abstract interface in different implementations, but the way it grew, they're sort of all 
separated and the same at the same time, so it's a little bit silly. Um, but regardless, um, in this case, uh, let's say you had an OSD op, a write came in over the wire, um, you would end up calling this do request um, method in the PG. We just saw the caller for that in OSD.cc, um, where it pulls something off its work queue and it passes it to do request. So that comes in here. Um, we do stuff to make sure that the PG is peered, um, back offs or something that is sort of client back pressure to make clients stop sending messages. Um, but assuming we've got to pass all that, we look at what type of messages, is it a operation? And if so, then we, that's more waiting. What do we do? If it's an operation, then we, um, we call do op. And this is where all the action happens um, for actual write request, read and write requests. Um, so again, there's some backups, back off stuff here. We make sure that um, we check whether it's a read or write operation. Um, we make sure the operation was sent to the right OSD, that it's actually allowed to do the operation that it's asking to do. But these are the, um, the CephX capabilities that are getting enforced right here. Um, sometimes operations are PG wide, like listing objects, and so those get passed off to another function. But assuming it's a per object thing, we check that the object name is valid. Um, and then we make sure the client isn't blacklisted because it was fenced out of the cluster. Um, and a, a bunch of other checks here to make Rados actually work. Rados is pretty complicated. Um, but uh, assuming you sort of make it through here, you end up, one of the main functions you end up with Duos DOPS, which takes the context contents of that Rados operation. Um, and sort of translates it into a back-end object sort transaction. So a so, Rados operation, yeah, go ahead. So uh, the DoSD OPs has one, uh, one OP context, but a vector of OPs. So why here we have the, yeah. the vector of OPs? If we yeah, so Rados, about it. so Rados operations, um, unlike a lot of other systems, um, a Rados operation is actually a, it's a compound operation. So one of those messages that goes over the wire, one Rados request, we call it, it can have multiple operations. So it might just have one read, read this object, read this byte range, but it could read like three different byte ranges and the attribute um, all at the same time. And so they all, those all get done together and the reply gets sent over the wire together. Um, or more commonly in the right case, you can do multiple operations. So you might have a Rados op that will um, write some data to the object, it'll set an attribute, um, and it'll set an OMAP key. And it could do all those things atomically and it'll get committed atomically um, to the system. And so that's, that's, why, that's why this is a vector because each of these requests is actually a, a list of things to do at the same time. So that's, that's implemented here in this DuoSD ops class. Um, so it's, it's again, we iterate over the vector here um, in this big for loop. Um, and we, again, just switch over the op code. So there are all these different op codes that get implemented. Some of, they're sort of grouped by what kind they are. So all the read, read operations are here. Um, you know, do read, for example, or um, let's see. Uh, at, sure. This is, how you, uh, since you asked about attributes. From, um, how you separate the replies when you're doing as a batch uh, of operation? Yeah, so um, uh, so I sort of glossed over this MOSD op request before. Let's, let's go back and look at that. So this is one of the most important messages in the system because it's the it's sort of the IO request that gets sent from a client, client to the OSD mm -hmm. and then gets sent back. And then there's another another one over here called MOSD op reply. That's the reply that gets oh, sent back. Okay. Okay. And what, um, what and is you'll the notice ID stored against each request? Some uh, IP address or somewhat like that. That's, sorry, could you say the question again? So I'm saying that what what is that identifier that separates uh, different clients, uh, like you mark it uniquely? Mm -hmm. So um, you, it's sort of hidden in these message definitions, um, but it's part okay. of the um, the message envelope around it. Oh, okay. um, each of the entities in the system that has a messenger has a unique um, address. It's an entity oh, adder okay. T. So okay. there's a, okay. in the message directory, there's a types thing, HD, adder, T. Um, and it basically, there's basically an IP address 
um, there's a type mm -hmm. which basically says um, whether this is a well, I guess this is not usually news in the legacy address, or we're about to implement a new version of this with mm -hmm. Messenger 2 on wire protocol. So it's which protocol you're speaking. And then there's a nonce, which is something like the PID or some other unique thing so that if there are multiple clients on the same IP address, they, mm -hmm. yes. they have a unique okay. identifier. So that's okay. what the integer T is. Um, and if you look in include and in include directory, there are a few header files in here that were originally shared between, well, they're still shared between the user space code and the kernel client code. Yes. That defines mm -hmm. some of the underlying types for this. So Messenger, for example, um, has things like uh, the message header, the old instance of it, the new header, which is the, sort of the envelope that surrounds each of these messages. And it includes, you know, there's a sequence number because it's an ordered stream of messages. Um, there's a transaction ID field that you can use so you can um, associate requests with replies. Um, and there's like the length of the payload basically here. Mm. So there's each message okay. has, um, yeah, all these bits and pieces. So anyway, if you go look at the MOSD op, which is an IO request, it includes this vector of OSD operations in it. Um, and if you want to know what those are, you can look in OSD types at each, and you can see what an OSD op is. And it basically is this structure, um, an object name, and then input and out output data which might be a little bit confusing, but it's because we use this class um, um, sort of on the OSD side. Um, when you send a message, you populate the in data, and then when as it processes it, it fills in the out data. And when you send the reply, it, it only sends the out data back to the client. Um, and so each of these OSD ops sort of has its own um, written data and read data, I guess, in a sort of general sense. Um, and I have a quick question. Yeah. So can you tell me uh, how does for every object when you write data, uh, how does it check whether that's present or not on before even committing to the disk or as uh, I say drive? How does it check the variety of the data as well as uh, how many number of reads do you does happen before for a write? How many reads are associated with a write? Mm -hmm. Okay, so two questions there. One is data integrity, and one is um, how many IOs we end up doing as a result of one of these? My question are intertwined because for data integrity, you would of course read the disk to know whether it's there or not. Is yeah. it true? Uh, it, it depends. Okay. <laughs> so okay, so I'll start first on the data integrity side, um, there are sort of two pieces of this. One is on the network side of things. Um, so when these messages are encoded and sent over the wire, the envelope, um, there's a header that I showed you. There's also a footer, and that includes a CRC of all the data that's um, for that message. And so as a center of the wire, we're doing CRC checks to make sure that we got what was sent from the other end because the TCP check something is just, it's just too weak. You get all kinds of errors if you rely on that. Um, so that sort of in, covers the integrity of data from getting from point A to point B. Um, once, it's, once you're writing it, um, it depends. It all depends on what the back end is. Um, so which object store implementation you're using. Um, and that determines how many IOs you do and what the data integrity guarantees are and so on. Um, in file store, um, there was no data integrity really because we're just writing things into regular POSIX file systems which don't do CRCs. Um, or if they do, they don't tell you about it. Um, so if you're using XFS, then you're on your own. If the device flips a bit, then you don't really notice. Um, mostly, we, we try to layer on CRCs, but it's sort of a opportunistic thing. The new um, backend, Blue Store, the newest implementation of the object store interface, um, uses the block device directly, and it does checksums on everything that it writes. Um, so it'll allocate some space on disk, it'll write the new data there, um, and then when it stores the metadata, it includes a checksum of the data along with the pointer to those bytes. So anytime we ever read data off of disk, we also then verify the checksum so that we got back what was written um, before. Um, so that's, that's where the data integrity is. Um, we don't, on a write, we don't like write the data, wait for the device to say it wrote it, and then read it back again to make sure that it actually did. Um, we don't do anything like that. That would be pretty paranoid and it wouldn't really be trustworthy anyway because if you read back data you just wrote, you're probably gonna hit the device's cache or something like that anyway. So it wouldn't necessarily mean that you had actually successfully read it. We, we generally just rely on the device to not lie to us when it says it wrote something. If we start, yeah. Um, as far as how many I, um, do you need any attributes before writing an object 
Yes. And also uh, overwriting. Please also cover overwriting first. How the initial write and then overwriting. How do you deal with these yeah. issues? So it it depends. So I'll talk about Blue Source since that's the new backend and it's the most um, easiest to understand probably. Um, so let's say you're writing to a new object. Um, so you have your message come across the network, the OSD one packet, um, turn it into an object store transaction that says write to this object. Um, the OSD um, actually, as it's processing that, is going to do a check to see if the object already exists. So it's going to call into the object store and say, um, load the metadata for this object. Um, in the Blue Store implementation, that metadata is stored as key value pairs in RocksDB. And so we'll do a get in RocksDB to try to look for this specific key value pair that um, maps to that object name. Um, if, if you're lucky, um, if you have enough memory, then most of that is going to be in RocksDB's cache, and so that won't actually generate an I.O. Um, and RocksDB will say either, I have this object, and here's the O node, which is sort of like the I node, or it'll say, I don't have it. It's a non-existent object, one of those two things. Um, if you're unlucky, then RocksDB will have to load one of its SSD files and do one or two I.O.s in order to make sure that that object doesn't actually exist. How many I.O.s depends on how many levels you have in your database and how much memory you have and whether your index filters and bloom filters and stuff are hitting and how effective those are. So there's like a whole world of rocks to be about how well that actually works. Um, there's a lot of work happening in Bluestore right now to make the caching um, of Bluestore much smarter so that we are very aggressively caching the um, the index filters and bloom filters for RocksDB to eliminate those IOs. Um, those have the highest priority in cache because um, they have sort of the best bang for buck as far as eliminating IOs to the device. Um, but you might miss. But in the optimistic case, you don't hit anything at all. Um, and so OSD decides that object doesn't exist. It generates a transaction to write it. That gets passed into the object store. Um, at that point, um, Blue Store is going to say um, it's going to pick a region on disk that isn't allocated. It's going to queue an I.O. to actually write to that space. And it's going to wait for that I.O. to actually go to the device and come back. It'll do this for a bunch of operations. Um, and at some point, it's going to, in sort of a batch fashion, it'll do a, it'll then um, issue a flush block device that says, that requests that the hardware actually make sure everything is actually durable um, and committed to the underlying stable medium or whatever. And when that returns, um, then Bluestore will turn around and it'll write the metadata that points to that new space. So the object data will get written over here. Once that's committed, then it'll um, submit a RocksDB transaction that says, there's now this object with name foo that is stored in these blocks. And that goes through the RocksDB transaction log and it then also does a write to the device and does a flush in order to make sure that actually commits to disk. Um, so in, in the normal case, when you're doing a write to an object, Maybe there's a read because you have a cache miss to determine whether the object exists or not. But assuming it doesn't, you'll do two IOs, one to write the data and then one to write the match data. And once that's committed, that'll tell the OSD that the transaction is safe. OSD will send a message back to the client saying, we're done, um, success, whatever. So which um, part of the OSD do you actually read the metadata? Like where, like before? Uh, yeah. Before starting, yeah, so there? that's... That was back in primary log PG in this do op function I was talking about. Okay. I was paging through here before. So in here, there is a spot where we figure out what the object name is. Um, where is it? Up. We make sure we're not sort of recovering the object and assuming all that stuff looks good. Then there's something called an object context, okay. which is basically the OSD's layer OSD layers handle to um, an object that might have some in-flight writes or reads to it. Um, it's sort of like a sort of like the inode, but it's at a, a slightly higher, it's one layer up. Um, and so it calls a function called. Right. So this is all in memory, right? This is all in memory. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Find object context. Yeah, this is what it calls right here. So this is a helper in the OSD that actually loads. This is where we actually load the metadata. Whoops. Um, find object context. Um, and you'll see what it does here. It calls get object context. Um, and it does a, first it looks up in its cache, because hopefully if you're doing, OSD has a, a cache at that layer. So usually it'll hit, it'll hit that. I guess it probably doesn't usually do it. But assuming it doesn't, it um, basically does a get adder 
um, that calls through through the PG back, PG back in to the object store and does a get adder on an object to load the attribute and, it, and to test if it exists. And if that's successful, then it installs an entry in this um, object context cache. And if it fails, then it, it creates a new one and also installs it into the cache. And then you get a ref to that cache basically here. So this is a reference counted pointer to that object in memory. And one, the important thing that OBC ob does, the, those object contexts, is they keep track of in-flight writes. So for example, if you have um, a read to an object and the read is like in progress, maybe it's an erasure code read and it has to go check, check to other nodes, and then you have a write that comes through, it'll hit that object context and the locks that, are, that do the read write ordering are in that class. And so it'll know to block the write and not stamp all over the, um, trample all over the read that's in progress or vice versa. So um, does it read all the attributes? Um, Trying to remember, I think I can't remember if it does. <laughs> Let me look at yeah, object context. So the so th you remember um, an an object has sort of three ways that it stores data. It has attributes, which are sort of analogous to finite attributes in a file system. They're meant to be small, with small a small number of them and relatively small values and small names. Um, and so it might load all those at once. It might only load the ones. It might only load. So there's one sort of magic attribute that's called underscore that has what's called the object info, and that's the, the rate of metadata about that object, like what version it is. Um, that's the main thing. <laughs> a few other things. Um, you know, what its, what its checksum is, if it has a object, full object checksum, that sort of thing. Um, and so that's, I think that's probably what it all loads. Um, let's see, OI, yeah, that's, yeah, see, OI adder. Um, that's the attribute that I was looking for. And if it has it, then it decodes it into an object info t right here and installs it in the cache. Um, so there's the attributes. There's OMAP, which is um, also key value data, but it's sort of meant to be unbounded. You could have megabytes of it into in a single object, and it's sort of you know random access. Values can be big, that sort of thing. And then there's the data portion, which is just a byte stream, kind of like a file. And so any object can have all three. It can have just byte data. It could have just OMAP. Usually it's just one or the other. Um, it's, it's a data object or it's a no map object and very rarely is it both, but it could be. Um, so before yeah, so writing an object, before writing a single object, these small read, when I say read, it is not only a disk, it is either a cache or to a disk. The, there are a couple, like two or three reads which are necessary for committing a write. Am I correct? It, it depends. So yeah, if, if if you miss all of your caches, then yeah. Um, like in the worst case, oh, you would miss yeah. the object contact cache. So you'd have to read the attribute, you'd miss the RocksDB cache, so you'd have to read the SST index, and you'd have to get the key value pair, and then it would get in the, Blue Store has its own cache, um, and then it would also get installed in the OST cache, and so on. Um, but in I, sort of the steady state workload, you tend to hit those caches, and so it, you don't have all those reads. So if we were to just, it's just a specific question that if we were to just map the number of attribute reads uh, independent of the object store, like irrespective of whatever be the object store, how many would that like uh, average out to be if in the worst case? So for like average writes, how many reads and how many writes so, get to read uh, on the back for end? A, for a single write, for a single write, how many number of small reads associated when i say reads it's yeah. only attributes how many number of attribute reads are there uh, yeah it it depends on the workload <laughs> it okay. depends on what type of object it is um but built in how many just built in just one uh right suppose it's a simple right or for an object how many number of associated attribute reads is required just a built in yeah um yeah, I'm not sure. It, it depends. I think. I think in the in the best case, there's one, or sorry, there's no reads and there's just a, a write. And in the worst case, there's going to be like a bunch of IOs to the underlying device to prime all the stuff. So what it average out is going to depend on how big your caches are, what your workload is, how big okay. your objects are, like 20 million different variables. So it's hard to say. Um, okay. And in the case of if in the case of like um, something like RGW then most writes are always to new objects. Um, so that's sort of one pattern. We're always writing to new objects and then we're updating a link to point to the new objects for a new put. Um, in the case of RBD, 
you, you tend to write to existing objects. Um, and so assuming you have a huge big enough data set that all the metadata doesn't fit in cache, then every write is going to load some metadata about that existing object and then make some update to it. Um, but it all, it all depends on how big your caches are. Okay. Yeah. So it, it sounds like you have a very specific workload in question in mind and you're trying to figure out. Uh, <laughs> if, if I just take a write only it, workload, yeah. a write only work, just a hypothetical write only workload. So uh -huh. uh, that I was thinking that what would be the implication of the, I don't have any reads and I don't have okay. any cache. Uh, okay. There's a piece of research that no cache is nothing. If you just write everything, how many reads will there be associated to those only which are related to attributes? Yeah, again, it, it depends on how much memory the OSD has. So I, it's hard to answer that question. Um, assuming okay. you have sort of a more normal deployment where you have you know a few gigabytes per OSD and you're writing to new objects, yeah. um, the RocksDB, um, all those caches are going to easily fit in memory. And so you're not, those aren't going to generate reads. And so a write is going to result in one write and there won't okay. be any reads. Yeah. So there won't be any reads, even to caches or just one. You have right? enough memory. Yeah. And I, I think in, in typical scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that answers three questions. Okay. Um, all right. So we're sort of jumping around here. Any, um, questions or suggestions on um, what parts of the code would be most useful to sort of look at. We just have a few minutes left here. Um, I, I've been focusing on the OSD. Should I look at a few of the other pieces here to give a bit of an overview? Um, let's look at let's look at the top level directory here. So um, we looked at the OSD code, which is the OSD daemon. This is the part of the OSD that talks to other OSDs and does replication and erasure coding, all that stuff. Um, we looked at OS, which is the object store. That's the actual backend that stores data on the local device. Um, we looked at, uh, let's see, the message directory, which is the API and implementations for passing messages and the actual message definitions themselves. Um, the other sort of, there's Mon. This is the Mon daemon. Um, it runs Paxos and sort of keeps track of who's participating in the cluster. Um, Manager is the new one um, that is similar to the Mon. Um, there's only there's generally only one of them active at a time, and it embeds the whole Python runtime, so you can write modules um, that run in the manager. Um, those those modules live in a directory called PyBind, which is where all of the all of the Python code is in PyBind. So this includes like wrappers for librbd, librgw. Libretos and so on, um, and it, there's a directory for all the manager modules. Um, so in here you can see um, there are more than 10 now. Um, like the dashboard is in here. There's like a bazillion files. For the dashboard, all the like JavaScript stuff is in there. Um, there's stuff for dumping to Zabbix, Prometheus, all that stuff. Um, these are all in here. Um, if you ever go looking for them. Um, let's see, other things at the top level that are interesting. Um, KV is, um, these are wrappers. This is our internal abstraction for a key value database. Um, there are three implementations right now. One wraps LevelDB, one wraps RocksDB, and one wraps, um, is an in-memory benchmarking one called MemDB. Um, pretty much everything now defaults to RocksDB, so the LevelDB one isn't really used anymore. Um, Blue Store uses the RocksDB one to talk to RocksDB, and the monitor uses RocksDB to store its own database stuff. Um, but KV, um, the the interface that they all, they all implement is key value DB. So it's a level DB like interface that gives you key value reads, gets and puts with transactions, basically. So you can imagine plugging something like Berkeley DB in here or something if you really wanted to. Um, and then let's see, the other interesting one is OSDC which is short for OSD client. Um, this is where all the client side initiator code for talking to the OSD lives. Um, the main one here is the weirdly named um, class called Objector, um, which reads and writes objects. Um, basically, so this is the actual client for talking to the OSD. Um, and it does things like, you know, it has a set of, um, you know, in-flight requests and, um, yeah, whatever, handles the replies and then does callbacks to the upper layer and so on. So if you look deeply, deeply in here, there's like um, 
uh, transaction class here that I'm looking at right now. That's not super interesting, but if you do look at like a read function down here, you know, you can tell it what object to read and it'll give you a return transaction ID and you pass it a, a context, which is like a callback that gets triggered. So all this code predates like C++11 and lambdas. Um, so context is a useful class to know about, to include. It's it's really simple. It's basically um, a, a generic class that has a finished function that takes a number that's um, pure abstract. So you implement your own callback by overloading this finished function to do whatever you need to do in your bottom half. Um, and then you pass pointers to these around. Um, and the code, um, the code when it triggers it will call either finish or actually it'll call this complete, which basically just calls finish and then deletes itself. So this is kind of how lambdas work, but it's not built into the language as it predates this. Um, there's a whole bunch of weird wrapper stuff in here that sort of lets context wrap lambdas and lambdas wrap context and all this stuff to sort of fully make the migration, but um, they're all sort of the same thing. Um, let's see, client is the CephFS client. Um, so it has its own client side, inode cache, and implements read and write. It has a buffer cache, all the stuff that you kind of expect for a file system um, client API. Um, and that, that implements all the complicated protocols between the client and the MDS for leases and locks um, on you know data or metadata and so on. Um, there's a parallel implementation of this basically in the kernel for the client. Um, other bits and pieces, there's libRBD is in here. Of course, that's all the RBD code. There's a huge hierarchy of all the operations and pieces of libRBD. Um, Libratus is the, oh, really? Yeah, all right, we're almost done here. Um, Libratus is basically a wrapper around Objector that um, packages that up as a shared library. Um, so, you know, if you look at libratus.cc, you have things like Rados in it, Rados create or whatever. Um, and they basically just sort of instantiate an object or basically, <laughs> and then pass through things and the, with the wrap things in nice, the nice C++ way or the nice C way to call into the object or and do the right thing. Um, and with the step context that is, that's associated with it, all that stuff. Um, so it's a relatively thin directory, but it, that's all there. Um, that's mostly it. There's an auth directory that has all the CephX and um, related authentication code. Um, Kerberos stuff is gonna land in there shortly. Um, there's a class directory, CLS. These are um, all of the Rados classes that can be dynamically loaded into the OSD to implement new Rados operations. Um, so you'll see there's a bunch of RBD classes that RBD uses, there's RGW classes that RGW uses on the OSD side to make atomic complicated updates to objects on the OSD side. Um, the journal thing is something that um, RBD journaling uses. There's some generic ones. There's a Lua one that lets you run Lua code, um, all kinds of stuff there. There's a Hello World one in here, I believe. Yeah, that's sort of an example to get you started on Rados classes. Um, that's mostly it. I think those are the interesting parts. Um, and we're out of time. <laughs> so um, I think uh, if you're here now or if you watch this later and there are specific areas of the code that you would like to go get more detail on, follow up on the list, um, reply to the email or, or send an email or mention it on IRC and we can do another one of these code walkthroughs that sort of zooms in on something else. But hopefully this gives you a bit of a high level overview of sort of where where the different pieces of the code are and how they sort of very roughly fit together. And then we can dive deeper some other time. Any questions before we wrap up? I would, uh, hi, I would like to have this um, LibRBD clients a little bit in detail if it is possible. Mainly I'm trying to do some caching with a prototype mm -hmm. exposed uh, the one like I try to work with OSDC object cache, but it's like a lot of dependencies in that layer I don't want to do. So I, I was just thinking of doing a prototype um, layer up okay. in the cache um, pass through and write back. So I was just interested in the a little okay. bit more. Okay, yeah, that's probably the right place to start. The object cacher stuff is pretty old code. It has a global lock. It doesn't 
go very fast and it's probably not what you need. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Jason is the one to do a deep dive on the RVD. Maybe we can schedule him to do one of these. Okay, sure. You know, mm -hmm. I actually week. tried looking through his uh, couple of uh, talks, but like, yeah, they don't talk this about the type code, of talk never happens. Like you are pretty yeah. brave, I would say, to take up a code work through of Seth. Yeah. I never thought yeah, somebody can do that. <laughs> it's a lot of code. Yeah. Well, the um, LibRBD has been probably completely rewritten, and it's probably three times bigger than it was the last time I touched it. So okay, okay. I actually don't know how it works anymore. <laughs> so okay. Jason is the one. Jason is the one to do it. Do a deep dive. No, there. it's fine. I just like yeah. whatever I I thought I just spoke. Of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other? Thank you so much. Requests. Can I ask a question? Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, uh, are they uh, all the attributes are stored in the object info T structure, right? Um, no. Um, the object info T is just Radius metadata about the object, so it has primarily um, the object version is sort of the main thing that's in there. Let me look. Go look at it. OSD, OSD types, object info t. So it's things like um, if it's a redirect to another object, this is a tiering thing. Um, it has, oh, that's not sorry, that's a manifest object info t. Here it is. Yeah, the name of the object, the version, um, a user visible version, the last request that touched it, size, it's m time, local m time. It has flags, um, bit. Bit flags about whether it has OMAP data or whiteout or it's dirty and stuff for tiering. Um, this is used for CephFS order truncates in a sort of weird way. Um, watchers, this is part of watch notify, the sort of pub sub thing of the Rados layer. Um, Pull object digests, which are sort of opportunistically set. Some hints. I think that's it. So the the underlying object store um, layer, um, it's concept of an object includes attributes and data and OMAP. Um, all of the attributes on the object, there's one of them that is just underscore and that stores an encoded object info T. And then all the other attributes are the ones that are visible to the user um, that are, yeah, are exposed to the Rados client or whatever. Um, and so if you set a specific attribute, it'll go all the way down to the object store layer. At the object store layer, blue store is, is going to cache all the attributes. That actually is true. Um, just it doesn't happen at the um, at this layer. So if you look in the blue store code, uh, uh, blue store types at h, and you look at blue store o node, which is sort of its inode type structure, um, it has you know some hints and so on, and it somewhere in here it stores the attributes. Yeah, the attributes for that object. So when blue store faults an all node o node sort of into its cache, it has all the attributes right there, and so a we'll call into the um, and that layer will be able to get them quickly or get all of them all at once or whatever it is. So uh, when the, the object store calls the attributes, so what's the data structure for those attributes? In blue store, it's all known, I know, but for the like the general object store. In the general object store, the interface looks like there isn't actually a data type. The um, It's an interface, so if you do get adder, you for the we give it the handle for the collection and the object name. You give it the name and you get a value out. So it's like get x adder the system call. And there's a variation of this called get adders that just fetches all of them and it'll give you an STL map of all attributes to their values. So this is the interface that consumers of that will use. And at the Rados level, uh, this is what the OST consumes. Um, at the Rados level layer on the other side of the network, there's a whole different set of operations that you can do um, that I don't remember quite what they are. Um, I can't remember if there's a get all attributes or not, but it's similar. You can go look at the radio setter files. Um, I apologize, I'm out of, I'm out of time. I had to go eat, eat dinner. <laughs> um, but thanks everyone for coming. And we're gonna post this on YouTube tomorrow or whatever. Um, follow up on the email list if you have questions about this or if you have other requests for other deep dives or topics you wanna cover. Um, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.